People have been trying to control nature for a long time, and our influence has become more and more dramatic. It is now so strong that following years of research and monitoring, an international group of geologists are suggesting we introduce a new geological age. The age of mankind, or rather, the Anthropocene. What awaits us in this new age? We interviewed a geologist, a historian and a philosopher in an attempt to answer the question of whether we're simply destroying our planet or if we'll be able to maintain it in a responsible way. We invited them to watch excerpts from recent episodes of Backlight that show how our lifestyle on Earth is changing. This is Backlight. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Well, I'm not a big believer in man-made climate change. No, I would say that uh, it goes up, it goes down. I think it's very much like this over the years. Uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll see what happens. The year 2016 was the warmest year ever recorded. This animation shows the pollution in China traveling across the Pacific and causing storms in the United States. And yet, climate change deniers continue to trivialize the growing influence of man on Earth. There is uh, indisputable evidence that we are, we are influencing uh, uh, world climate and world environments more and more and more. And uh, to close your eyes to that sort of problem is, is, is well, it's, it's what you might call a flat Earth attitude, you know. It's uh, saying the world is flat, uh, pretending there's no problem when there really is one, is, is, is as irresponsible as it, can, as it can be. Phil Gibbard, a geologist at Cambridge University, started a working group dedicated to the introduction of this new term, Anthropocene. The irreversible influence of mankind is obvious, though it's difficult to determine the exact onset of the Anthropocene. Well, there is no doubt that natural processes are being influenced by humans. We only need to look around us in terms of the holes we're digging in the landscape or um, we're building embankments for railways and motorways. And of course, then there's the, the ways in which we're influencing the gases in the air by uh, polluting pollution from automobiles and the like, uh, ships, etc., aeroplanes. And of course, there's the uh, effect of, of material which we're burying in the ground, waste materials, etc. And these, of course, are, are passing um, from where they're originally stored out into, along river systems and into, into the sea. Uh, plastic materials can now be found almost all over the world's ocean floors. So there's no doubt that uh, human activities are influencing natural systems everywhere we go. So the question is, if we're going to recognize a point at which that's changed, where would that point be? Would we draw it very close to the present day, as some people have suggested, because of the effect of industry? You know, the logarithmic growth effectively with countries like China and India, you know, developing very, very rapidly? Or um, would we draw it far back in time where humans um, began to influence natural systems by, for example, killing large numbers of large uh, mammals and vertebrates, which we see at the end of the last ice age, and that began over 40,000 years ago, but it reached a peak probably about um, 10,000 or slightly less years ago. So, you know, we no longer see the mammoth, for example, and this is a, one, one of the victims of, of the um, human um, activity of uh, killing large vertebrates. These creatures lived through many climatic oscillations previously, so it's not likely to be climate that's killed the large vertebrates, but the common denominator in the killing of all the vertebrates was, um, is, is the rise of humans. Geologists are searching for the exact point at which this new era began. Meanwhile, the Anthropocene is a practical term which can now be used by those concerned with ecological issues to make us more aware of our influence on Earth. 
Among these people is the French philosopher and anthropologist Bruno Latour. L'anthropocène, c'est un terme de... introduit par des climatologues, chimistes, géologues. Ce n'est pas un terme de science sociale, ce n'est pas un terme de science politique. C'est un terme venu des sciences naturelles, disons, et offert aux sciences sociales et aux sciences politiques comme une énigme, disons. C'est un terme énigmatique qui d'ailleurs n'est pas du tout euh, approuvé par euh, l'ensemble de la communauté euh, scientifique. Donc c'est un, un point d'interrogation. Mais qui dit quelque chose d'important, elle dit euh, « devinez-moi euh, et devinez quelle est le, la force géologique la plus importante euh, actuellement ». Et euh, c'est l'humain, mais on ne sait pas trop sous quelle forme. Euh, en tout cas, c'est... Euh, l'ensemble des agissements de la société industrielle contemporaine, disons. Human behavior is a geological force that has been changing the Earth for a very long time. Our influence on Earth started the moment we began to hunt and farm, according to ecologist John Liu. Well, This was the land of milk and honey. This was the promised land. These are the, the places where historically people have done agriculture and done animal husbandry for thousands of years. But the lands are exhausted. They allow hundreds and thousands of sheep and goats to walk across here and any, any green thing that sticks up its head is food. And they're just walking around here getting everything. Well, you can't let them do that anymore. They'll have to stop. They've been doing that since thousands of years, and that's what's destroyed this area. So if that doesn't stop, you won't be able to fix this. For centuries, we assumed that nature was inferior to us. This concept was cast aside by German explorer Alexander von Humboldt around 200 years ago. He believed that all natural phenomena on the various continents were interconnected. His theory influenced many scientists, including Charles Darwin. It also forms the basis for the ideas of current environmental movements. Historian Andrea Wolff wrote a biography about Humboldt, revealing a scientist with foresight. Well, let's start with a few facts. So he was born in 1769. He was the second son of a wealthy Prussian aristocratic family, but he left his life of privilege behind and he um, went on this five-year exploration of Latin America. And it was really a, a journey that shaped his life and his thinking and that made him legendary and famous across the world. And what happened there is that he came back with a new concept of nature. He began to describe nature as a web of life, as a, he described Earth as a living organism, as something where everything was connected. So he comes back with this new concept of nature. And because he sees nature as this web, he also understands that if you pull on one thread, the whole thing might unravel. Because what he saw there was how colonialism, how plantation, how monoculture had destroyed nature. And because he saw nature as a global force, he also, he could make connections that other scientists didn't make. So at that time, other scientists were very much looking through the narrow lens of classification. They were kind of collecting plants and sorting them. But he was seeing plants as a global force, he was seeing climate as a global force. So he understood that, for example, monoculture or irrigation was destroying nature as a whole. So in 1800, while he's in South America, he talks about harmful human-induced climate change. And that makes him really, I mean, he did, it's so prophetic. When you read what he's writing there, it's unbelievable. The late 18th century, early 19th century, the, the buzzword was really improvement. So humans were improving nature. So you would, so the wilderness, the jungle, the wilderness was seen as the howling wilderness, was seen as something awful, terrible, something to be tamed. 
until the mid 18th century, mountains were seen as something really terrible. So tourists who crossed the Alps would blindfold themselves so they wouldn't see the horrible mountains because they, it was seen as something really um, scary. So, so it's smooth nature, it's, it's lawns, it's um, finely trimmed trees. That's, that was the ideal at that time. So for someone like Humboldt to come along and say, we're destroying this, is, is a huge, huge intellectual leap, actually. En Europe, euh, au XVIIe siècle, euh, ensuite du XVIIe au XXe, disons, euh, l'ordre de la nature, si on peut dire, est un ordre qui est quand même relativement euh, en, en, en background, en, en, en l'arrière, le décor, disons. Et puis il y a l'activité historique des, des humains qui est sur scène. Donc il y a une scène avec l'action des humains et puis il y a un background euh, dans lequel euh, il y a, qui est relativement stable quand même. Et ce que l'anthropocène introduit, euh, ou réintroduit, parce qu'on le savait évidemment avant, mais on le savait symboliquement, disons, c'est que euh, les, le décor est monté sur scène, évidemment, tout simplement. Euh, C'est-à-dire que là, parmi les actions euh, auxquelles il faut qu'on soit attentif, il y a celle de, de la terre, du climat, euh, des, qui sont aussi nos actions en réaction aux réactions de la Terre sur notre propre action, disons. Donc tout ça change complètement l'ordre de la nature. En plus, parce que d'abord, autrefois, l'ordre de la nature était supposé indifférent. Euh, les humains avaient leurs passions, leurs euh, idées, leurs idéologies, euh, leurs religions, mais l'ordre de la nature était indifférent. Tandis que maintenant, il n'est pas indifférent, il est sensible à notre propre, euh, notre propre action. Donc euh, on ne peut pas parler de la nature comme on en parlait euh, en, au XXe siècle. On imaginait quand même que c'était possible de tenir à distance les questions de, de nature, oui. Euh, ou qu'il s'agissait de dominer la nature, ou d'être dominé par elle. Euh, maintenant, l'imbroglio est beaucoup plus intime. Et en plus, ce n'est pas la nature en général, c'est la Terre. Euh, parce que la nature, pas, ça s'intéresse aux étoiles, ça s'intéresse au centre de la Terre, ça s'intéresse à des tas de choses. Le mot de nature est beaucoup trop vaste. Tandis que ce dont il s'agit, les, les réactions climatiques, euh, au sens large du terme, c'est des réactions qui portent sur une toute petite partie de notre, de notre nature ancienne, et qui est euh, la, euh, la Terre. Mais c'est la partie importante. Et pas toute la Terre, c'est juste la superficie, du, la surface, la fine surface, sur laquelle tout ce qui est vivant et qu'on connaît euh, existe. Donc, Rien, rien ne reste de l'ancienne idée de nature, ni l'indifférence, ni la dimension trop vaste, euh, ni le fait qu'elle est supérieure à nous, ni le fait qu'elle est euh, objective et qu'on peut simplement la dominer, etc. Et c'est ça qui est difficile pour les, les humains actuels, parce que tout change. Now, what we have to understand is that, from a geologist's point of view, and I'm a geologist, geological time is divided into units which we name. For example, the Carboniferous for the coal period, or the Jurassic from the mountains in Switzerland, etc. And these are formally defined periods of time. So, to just to, to complete the story, as it were, we are still living in the period before the Anthropocene, as, as currently defined, which is the Holocene. And the Holocene began 11,700 years ago, and it's, it's what we call an interglacial period. And this interglacial period, this temperate period, which we, which we are living in now with high sea level and very few glaciers compared to the Ice Age, obviously, is, is just a short, warm period within the Ice Age itself, which we call the Quaternary, or the Pleistocene. And there have been as many as 25 of these warm periods, and a similar number of glaciations in the last two and a half million years. And we're just living in one of those warm periods, and eventually it will come to an end. 
but our activities may prolong this interglacial artificially. And that's uh, why people are pointing to this term Anthropocene and saying, because we are artificially prolonging what is, after all, a natural, um, warm, relatively warm period, um, we should have another name for that, and that's why they use this term. We're not certain what the long-term effects of artificial warming might be. It largely depends on us. In some places, people are trying to profit from it. In Greenland, so much ice has melted and the temperatures are so high that this has offered several new possibilities. From this perspective, the Anthropocene is not so much a problem as an opportunity. This year is the first time ever that uh, strawberries will be on the market for sale. First time ever. Uh. See the strawberries. See how big they are. Mm. I bet this is the best strawberry of the world. <laughs> As an indigenous population trying to manage life in global sense requires us to adapt very fast. If we are not to be the losers of climate change, we simply refuse to be the losers of climate change. We have lived 4,500 years in Greenland. We have undergone several climate changes. We have managed them all. We are going to manage this one too, with new opportunities, with new challenges. As the ice melts faster and faster, Greenland now not only has its arable land, but it can also extract uranium and rare earth metals from the land. They've been advertising this country is open for business. And they've set up a system where it's easy to get a permit for exploration. And it's kind of a streamlined application process from exploration into development of an actual mine, if they're so lucky. So it's partly the economy and partly the government trying to sell the country to the world that we're open for business here in Greenland now. If we start to melt the Greenland ice sheet, uh, not so much the floating ice, because that won't make any difference. The Greenland ice sheet is equivalent to six metres sea level rise, so if we melt that, um, there's going to be large areas of many parts of the world, uh, coastal regions, which will, be, which will be flooded. It was not being managed at all. In a sense, it's a runaway. We're not in control of this. We're experimenting with this, and we're playing Russian roulette with this planet. I sincerely believe that to be the case. The activities of humans have been going on for some time already. I mean, after all, Homo sapiens appeared well before uh, the present um, period, um, as much as 100,000 years ago or more. Um, so the activities of, uh, of humans were, of course, relatively, uh, uh, relatively unimportant when there were very few of us. But as our numbers have grown and grown and grown, uh, then uh, clearly our, our, our impact is becoming uh, equally large, especially during the industrial era. La désinhibition, ça consiste à dire euh, j'entends les alarmes, mais je fonce. Et c'est là où il y a quelque chose de très pervers euh, dans les, les, les deux derniers siècles, c'est d'entendre les innovations, les, 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 les alarmes, et de dire je, je les entends et je fonce. Qui est le moment, en gros, euh, des milieux du 19e siècle, enfin, ce, ce moment très important, où on commence à voir toutes les transformations de l'industrialisation, disons. Et on décide, on y va, on, on fonce. C'est un moment difficile. Donc la boucle de rétroaction, c'est aussi le, 
le fait de se, non seulement de se rendre sensible et d'entendre les alarmes, mais aussi de modifier son comportement, tout simplement. Donc de s'ajuster à des situations de, de limite. Mais ça va évidemment contre beaucoup de d'idées sur le, la modernisation triomphante euh, le, qui rompt avec les tabous, qui euh, s'interdit les limites et qui passe par-dessus les, 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 les oppositions. Donc c'est aussi une, un conflit de valeurs. These three guys on a sailing ship disagree with the idea that everything that's modernized is automatically better. They're trying to convey the message that we should stop transporting our products on polluting, fuel-oiled-powered ships. We are on board of the Tres Hombres now. The world's only sailing freight die uh, regelmatig de oceanen bevaart. Totaal zonder motor. Twee masten. En uh, met dit schip uh, zijn we bezig een revolutie in de transportsector te uh, veroorzaken. De vraag naar biologische producten ook, uh, en, te, en te vetere producten. Dat is de enige markt eigenlijk die nog aan het stijgen is, die nog aan het groeien is. En dan. Uh, Hetgene wat dat allemaal mist uh, om, om de kring gewoon, uh, van een product, een cyclus rond te maken, is het vervoer. Dat, uh, en dat zijn wij dan. Dus als je dan biologische wijn uit Zuid-Afrika drinkt, dan ben je gewoon niet goed bezig. Omdat uh, wat jij de grond in Zuid-Afrika niet toevoegt, dat gooi je bij het transport de lucht in. Gewoon. Dit is een symbool, dit is een uh, ambassadeur voor... Uh... Ja, voor een, een nieuwe wereld waarin uh, andere maatstaven gelden. Je kunt ook in zekere zin zeggen dat we in plaats van met onze tijd mee tegen de tijd ingaan. Het is fun, maar het is niet terribly innovatief in a way. I mean, it's, it's a... Typically, we turn to uh, a land of old, with mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. an old technology. It, it's interesting, but this is a part of scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, yes, yes. We, so are, we, we are nine billion now, so <laughs> see how. Except if it makes people realize that it's absurd to have a biological wine from South Africa transported very expensively. Then. All of these things are useful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but. But for nine billion people, it won't. Work. Sorry. For nine pe nine billion people, it won't work. See, but it's a problem of scale, which is the problem we have. Yeah. No, nobody had to tackle before the question of being eight or nine billions. Yeah. So. To feed nine billion mouths, we need to handle food production efficiently. Scientists in Wageningen, the Netherlands are trying to prevent fungal diseases so as not to lose a single head of lettuce anymore. In our Anthropocene, we are focused on perfecting nature. I am vooral to false at aan to kijken. That is echt the most ziekte. Yeah, a bit of tegenstander, zeg maar. Yeah. Valse meer, dat is mijn tegenstander. Nou, dit is uh, de wilde slaassoort waar ik al uh, meer dan tien jaar aan werk. Uh, Lactica saligna heet die. En nou, waarom is hij zo interessant? Uh, hij is de enige wilde slaassoort die resistent is tegen alle varianten van die valse meeldouw. Dus die, die eigenschap die willen we in de gewone cultuursla. Cultuursla is gewoon de sla die we in de winkel kopen. Ja. Dan heeft hij de helft van de eigenschappen van deze plant en de helft van de eigenschappen van die plant. En dan ga je hem nog een paar keer terugkruisen met cultuursla, zodat je zeg maar 95% van alle eigenschappen van deze plant hebt. En dat ene interessante, die resistentie van die wilde, die wil je daarin hebben. Elk jaar waarschijnlijk zijn er al weer nieuwe mutanten van die schimmel ontstaan en dan moeten ze nu meteen aan de slag. Want anders verspreiden die over heel Europa, misschien is het nu nog maar een paar veldjes. 
Maar als ze daar niks aan doen, dan binnen een paar jaar dan, dan komen die luizen en die schimmels, die nieuwe, overal voor. Deze wil ik als moeder. En dan wil ik alleen de eistellen van. Maar er zit nu al stuifmeel, dus pollen. Dus er zijn eigenlijk een soort spermacellen van zichzelf. Die zitten er al op, maar die willen we niet. We willen van deze. We willen deze als vader. Dus dan ga ik nu de pollen ga ik eraf spuiten met water. En dan pak je een bloemetje die dus vanmorgen is opengegaan en waar het pollen nu ook bovenop zit. En dan smeer ik eigenlijk in feite het pollen op die andere bloem. In case our plants don't survive and become extinct, there is the global seed vault high up in the north of Norway. In this bunker, around 10,000 different types of seeds are kept at low temperature to prevent plant species that are important for our food supply from disappearing forever. It safeguards our planet's biodiversity. These seeds will survive the Anthropocene. where it gets really cold. Now, this is it. This is it, yeah. This is the biggest, most diverse collection of agricultural diversity in the world, in this room. It's a, it's a real history of agriculture. It's a history of everything that the crops have seen in the past, and it's everything the crops are going to be in the future. Is this the way to approach the future? Bruno Latour believes we will discover a new world during the Anthropocene. Will we respond to this world with the same amazement as the explorers who encountered new continents during their world travels? Au moment où on a découvert euh, où les Européens, l'Amérique, euh, des terres nouvelles, on a eu une impression de d'amplification euh, énorme de l'horizon. Là, il se passe un peu la même chose, en, en sens que de difficulté à comprendre qu'est-ce qui se passe, qu'est-ce qu'on a découvert, euh, qui sont ces gens, euh, comment ils fonctionnent, euh, qu'est-ce que c'est que cette terre inconnue, etc. Et en fait, toutes ces questions reviennent, mais non pas en, en, en surface, en extension, mais en, 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 en dessous de nous, en gros. C'est-à-dire, il euh, y a une nouvelle terre, c'est-à-dire cette terre qui est agitée et, et sensible à nos mouvements, mais qu'on qu ne connaissait pas. Et qui, euh, est une terre nouvelle. Some say the new world will extend far beyond our planet. As we're running out of fossil fuels, perhaps we will be able to get them elsewhere. Some American companies claim to be ready to extract fossil fuels from other planets. Their commercials herald unlimited possibilities. What will tomorrow look like? Our world is at its limits. And yet, we all want more. And why not? Why shouldn't the future be brighter than today? But where will it come from? Simple. Our tiny planet sits in a vast sea of resources, including millions of asteroids bathed in the sun's free energy 24 hours a day. The same rocks that could fall from our skies also contain everything we could ever need, both out there and down here. It's time someone seized the opportunity. Deep Space Industries. <laughs> Where did you get that? 
uh, there's a tremendous amount of platinum locked up in asteroids and platinum group metals. And that's what we would bring back to Earth because platinum group metals are extraordinarily scarce on Earth. We're not finding any more. We're closing down mines here on Earth because we're running out of platinum to, to mine. And that's what we would bring back to Earth is these platinum group metals. We immediately detect a guy who wants to set us uh, rockets to go to a meteorite. But this is, I mean, it's not that it's silly, it's just that it's 1950s. Nothing has changed, except maybe he says the technology is cheap and so on. But the, 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 the way the frame is the same, exactly the same as well. So we, we have to detect, we have to learn how to detect the differences between these things without being intimidated by the hype. I'm from the wine family, so I'm, the wine testing, I'd say. You have a technology testing mechanism to I mean, mm. No, this is disgusting. No, this is not good. This is, which is a way to learn how to uh, build a civilization, which is always artificial, of course. We are doing the wine tasting. And if colonizing the universe isn't the answer, we may need to develop new technologies that we can use here on Earth. We're using seawater because it's really abundant. As you know, in these areas, fresh water is really scarce resource. So we want to take what we have enough of, like sunlight, like arid areas, like CO2 and salt water, to produce what we need more of, sustainably produced food, water and energy. So here we have a concentrated solar power facility where the sunlight is reflected in the mirrors to this tube filled with oil that gets very, very hot. And that energy is used to drive a desalinization factory here to produce fresh water from the salt water. These are the technologies that have the ability to touch the lives of a billion people that are doubling in power and performance every six months, year, 18 months, two years. They are technologies that are enabling small teams to do extraordinary things. And they're effectively impacting every aspect of our life. So I'll give you one example. Exponential technologies are now impacting food. In the middle of the desert, salt water is being turned into fresh water which is then used to cultivate vegetables. Here we're growing cucumbers. And uh, these are planted about three weeks ago, and now we're harvesting the first cucumbers. In three weeks? Yeah. Is that normal for us, or is that uh, really fast for cucumbers? It's cucumber? quick, and we have good growers, so it's a lot of sunlight. It's interesting. Yeah. The comparison with the other one wants to send, to break the limits without modifying the, the type of interesting for this resource. It's, that's why probably we, we've find the guy, the, the guy before a bit fishy, because yeah. it's just breaking the limit, but getting the same resources. Now it's emptied on Earth. He has gone everywhere, now he goes in space. Here, it's, there's a, a shift in, in, in the techniques. So it's, yeah, this is interesting. But can technology be better of scale, maybe, a very important solution in that respect to deal with the new world? I don't believe in technology as isolated from the rest, so yes, artificiality is better. We have to make artificial everything. Well, you know that you are Dutch, so... The Dutch is an example that every artificial thing is, is necessary. So we, we, we transform completely. Uh, the question is how to select between two artifacts, the one which are uh, going in the good direction and one which are going in the bad direction. So it's not a question of technology, it's a question of uh, selecting shibboleth. There needs to be a will to put aside the technologies which we have, which after all are very crude if they're, they're based on you know burning fossil fuels rather than using our technological knowledge which we've uh, assembled over, over the last two centuries or more. There's no limit, I think, to what we could potentially achieve if the desire is there. 
but I fear that the desire is 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 not there in everyone, and this is a, a, a principally a, an educational problem. And also, you know, we have we have uh, people in power in some countries who don't believe that there's anything to worry about anyway. But I believe in technological innovation. I'm sure I'm sure we can we can make uh, considerable inroads into this problem. Yes, and relatively quickly too, by the way. I think technology can help, but I don't think we can rely on that technology is going to solve um, global warming. I think that we have to massively change um, the way we live. And I don't think we can sit there and wait and say, like, oh, you know, fine. We just have to wait a few a couple of decades and then the engineers are going to come up with this like amazing thing they're going to like inject into the atmosphere. All that really scares me a lot. Um, if people rely on that. And also, we don't know what the effect of that would then be. So, uh, you know, I think we need, to, we need to change and we can't just rely on technology. Although technology isn't the be-all and end-all, it can help to wake us up during the Anthropocene. The wastewater from this sewage plant is purified by microorganisms that feed off the roots of plants. In this way, the sewage plant is also the local botanical garden. We started to use uh, plants as a part of the technology, not because plants can remove so much nutrients or contaminants, but they using the plant roots as a, as a special and unique surface where different organisms can attach. And then there are only the hormones and the, and, the, and the drugs from pharmaceuticals remain. We could also find special creatures and species which can eat even those uh, parts. I, I, I think it's very important to tell people that we need to rely on biology, we need to rely on nature. Actually, what, what we are doing here, we use several thousand of different species in an engineered community to clean the water. But as every living organism, this can be killed. So the idea that we are going to bring these treatment plants much closer to the public, so they can see that this is a very efficient living system, but still a living system, a living organism, uh, uh, which can be very, very sensitive to what we are doing and what we let uh, into the, the, the sewage. So it's better take care. They will understand that, that uh, uh, throwing chemicals into the, the, the sewage will go directly into the neighboring garden, palm house, and will kill these plants. I think that it is very important to change the attitude. I think that one of the biggest problems with modern society is that, that we believe that there is nature and, uh, and, and us. Uh, and and, and, and to, to, to change it, that, that this is not, not the case. We are part of this nature. We are part of this planet. We are the only species on Earth uh, which can change and, 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 uh, its history its, its, uh, 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 and, and its future. So how we see ourselves as part of the nature is a key uh, to find solution that, that, that we, we, don't, we don't have to, to save the environment. The environment is us. Il faut, il faut, vous le dites aussi, euh, sensibiliser les gens. Comment on peut faire ça Je ne crois pas qu'il faut sensibiliser. Les gens sont, on est sensible ou pas, euh, selon que on est capable de comprendre le monde dans lequel on est. Euh, si on vous dit qu'il y a un incendie dans la, dans cet bâtiment, euh, il y aura probablement une alarme qui va sonner. On ne va pas discuter, on va sortir. La sensibilité se construit. On n'est pas sensible ou pas sensible. Il faut des instruments. Il faut des instruments, il faut des alarmes, il faut des dispositifs auditifs, il faut tout un appareillage pour être sensible. Comme on, quand on fait un film, il faut des appareils aussi pour être sensible. Donc, euh, de cette sensibilité, nous avons quelques exemples. D'abord, évidemment, avant tout, les sciences, les sciences de la Terre, qui nous ont rendu sensibles euh, les phénomènes euh, climatiques au sens large. Il y a évidemment euh, les arts qui jouent un rôle très important dans la 
saisie du phénomène euh, qui nous rend sensibles. Se rendre sensible, c'est organiser une civilisation capable de ressentir très vite les transformations qu'elle a elle-même suscitées. That's exactly what a group of around 900 concerned citizens tried to do. On behalf of them, sustainability organization Urgenda sued the Dutch government. Dames en heren, de rechtbank. Because it felt they weren't doing enough to reduce CO2 emissions. It was the first time ever that a case like this had been presented in court. Dan zal ik nu overgaan tot het uitspreken van het vonnis. De rechtbank beveelt de staat dat de uitstoot in Nederland in het jaar 2020 zal zijn gereduceerd met tenminste 25% ten opzichte van het jaar 1990. Anders gezegd, het berusten in een geringere reductie is onrechtmatig tegenover agenda. Dan kom ik. gewerkt voor deze zaak en het is uiteindelijk zo'n groot maatschappelijk belang waar het hier over gaat uh, dat ik er niks aan kan doen dat ik even mijn professionaliteit hier uh, verlies. Uh, het is, dit, dit is echt een zaak die, die uit je tenen komt. En we hebben hier echt heel veel voor moeten geven om de rechter ervan te overtuigen dat, dat we hier een zaak hebben. En dat het ook de taak van de rechter is om hier in te grijpen. Gelet op, op zoals de rechter dat ook zegt, de enorme omvang van het gevaar zoals dat, dat, zoals dat ons in de nabije toekomst uh, zal overkomen. Het een petite uh, revolution? Small, but you need lots of small things like that to shift. Uh, and especially because it's inside the, a, a language which people understand better, which is the language of law and sovereignty. So it, it ties with, with things for which we are used to, which is the normal ways in which the question of, of personal rights, of uh, laws against discriminations, uh, laws about um, uh, inequality have been argued. So it, it registers in the Western ear in a way which is easier to understand that protection of nature or something like that. Here it's their, their, their rights which have been uh, attacked by the state. So it has, it, it has a beautiful uh, sort of uh, simplification of the issue. It's, it's a much more easier to understand language than the difficulty of science or politics or metaphysics or philosophy or lots of other things. While we can relate to this legal language, scientist Alexander von Humboldt tried to increase our receptivity to the idea of interconnectedness on our planet through drawings and prints. He wanted to activate our sensitivity to nature. I think that's one of the most important aspects of Humboldt's work is that we tend to draw this very sharp line between the arts and the sciences. And he doesn't do that. I, I call him also the founder of infographics um, because he uses art um, in a way to explain his science. So he has these extraordinary maps and graphics where, which are packed with complex scientific data, but he expresses them so visually and graphically that everybody can understand it with one, you know, one glimpse because he believes that knowledge should be accessible for everybody. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that he is completely unafraid of involving emotions in, into science. So he says, yes, we have to measure science. I mean, he schleps 42 scientific instruments across Latin America. But at the same time, he says, we need to feel nature and we need to understand nature by using our imagination. He says that 
poets like Goethe, for example, and their description of nature in their poems are as truthful as the discoveries of the best scientists. So for him, it really belongs together. And it's something that I personally, I think, is really, really important and absolutely lacking in today's environmental debates in the political arena. So there's this, what I'm really missing is this sense of wonder for nature, this awe for nature, this, you know, you, you have the Paris Climate Summit, for example, and everything is based on dry statistical projections. Very important, but it doesn't really talk to our soul in a way. And it, they're, they're, what I'm missing is this realization or recognition that we will only, we'll only protect what we love. And um, and I think there's a reason why this very famous uh, photograph of Earthrise that was taken during the Apollo 8 mission in 1968 from from Apollo, you know, where you see Earth as this tiny, tiny marble, white and blue marble set against the blackness and vastness of space, has been hailed as the beginning of the environmental movement because that's the very first time that we saw Earth in her wholeness and also as this very fragile little thing in space that's a, you know but but that happened with a photograph oh my god look at that picture over there there's the earth coming up wow is that pretty you got a color film jim hand me a roll of color quick oh man that's color cool. where is it quick on c368 hey i've got it right here Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.